Thank you for tuning in to part one of two videos on the topic of transitioning to adulthood for students with high functioning autism spectrum disorder or ASD. This video includes the perspectives of a parent of a young adult with ASD and a high school transition teacher with experience preparing special education students for adult living. Bridget and Eric will discuss considerations for planning at the beginning of a high school student's career, navigating high school diploma options, the benefits of participating in transition classes in high school, and college preparedness. Bridget is a special education teacher and a parent of three children living in a rural community in Northwest Oregon. Her son, Frank, is on the upper end of the autism spectrum. He recently completed high school with a regular diploma and is about to complete a one-year culinary program at PCC. She will share her experiences and thoughts about how parents can help their children with high-functioning autism to prepare for adulthood as well as some important considerations about choices that come up in this process. Eric is a high school special education teacher in Washington County, specializing in supporting students in the important area of transition. In this video, he will share his knowledge and advice for parents of children on the upper end of the autism spectrum as it relates to preparing their children for the transition to adulthood, including the topics of employment, economics, accessing community resources, and considerations for diploma options. Um, the best advice that I would have for other parents who have um, children who have um, special needs um, that are more high functioning um, is that when they're getting ready for high school, they need to really find that case manager that they're going to be able to work with and really be a part of that process with their child the whole way through, making sure that you honor what the child wants to do, what, what your child wants to do, but also making sure that they still have to do the other things that the school is going to require them to do um, and figuring that out with the case manager. Um, but I think being a part of that with them will make it much more uh, meaningful to them as well as being a parent. I think including uh, your student or child in every aspect of the IEP process. I think um, self-determination, I think self-advocacy. I am shocked at the number of ninth and 10th grade students who come in and will tell me that they have a math disability when they don't have a math disability. You know very little about autism or Asperger's. And that's one of the first things that we do is try, is try to talk about those things. Um, and because those, are, those would be the areas that would be challenges for a job or, or succeeding at a university. And so I, I want the student to really understand the nature of the disability and, and, and what are some strategies and things that they can do. And I, and I find a lot of time I really encourage at the ninth grade, if they haven't been, you know, I always ask the student to be there, but you'll find I'm surprised a lot of times, even in a ninth grade meeting, sometimes the student doesn't come, the parents come. So there, there are challenges in graduating with a regular diploma in, in the, uh, with the new diploma requirements that uh, have recently been enacted. One of the things that I worry about is there's a de-emphasis on social skills and transition. So students are taking more academic classes, which is good, um, but they're getting less of the skills that they need in order to survive in the real world. And so you'll have a, you'll have a student who's focused on making sure they have the four Englishes, the three maths, the two sciences, but may not have had the experience they used to have going out in the community and working at a job training site like in my program. They may not um, have had the intense social skills that they've had in the past. So what I'm finding, especially with, uh, with Asperger's and high-functioning students, is they're, they're able to go to PCC. That's not an issue. They get enrolled. And then when they get to PCC, there, there, there are issues, um, some of the social skills issues, some of the being able to self-advocate for yourself in a class of 200 students, not knowing where to go to get assistance. 
And so that, to me, is more of a reason why kids who are, get, who, kids who are getting a regular diploma or maybe aren't succeeding in, in college. As far as the academic requirements of the diploma, uh, you may, depending on what they are, I, there's a lot of uh, misconception that, uh, I hear this all the time, that Asperger's students have a, a deficit, um, have, are great in math and have a deficit in other areas. Um, and sometimes some of the students that we're working with have deficits in math. Um, and so if you or have deficits in reading or writing or have deficits in one area, and when you're being asked to, you know, to make sure in order to go to college and get uh, FAFSA funding, when you're, when you're, when you have one deficit that's holding you back and yet you're completely successful in everything else, um, that, that is a major hurdle in order uh, to achieve academic success. An example would be that um, you know, Asperger's is, is social communication, and sometimes the, sometimes the writing is, is a piece that really trips people up. Although they're successful in math, they have good grades, and that could be something that can prevent you from getting a, a regular work and diploma. Probably the most difficult challenges of having um, my son get a regular diploma versus a modified diploma um, in the high school were in helping the teachers see what accommodations and modifications that he needed um, to be able to regulate himself to get the work done. The work wasn't the problem, it was actually being in a classroom setting to get some of the work done or to understand it. It was very difficult um, post-secondary to try and figure out what to do with him. Looking back now, trying to think how I would have done something differently. <clears throat> I think in my son's case, I probably would not have pushed as hard to have him get a regular diploma. I think that really hurt him in the long run. Had he gotten a modified diploma, he probably would have then been able to receive other services that he is not able to receive now. And one of the challenges for um, my son in figuring out where to go next was because he had earned a regular diploma, there wasn't a whole lot of programs out there that were going to meet his needs because they were either going to be, you know, regular college, which would not give him enough support. Even the junior colleges, if I was just to send him and have him sign up, I think he would have been so overwhelmed. I don't even know if he would have made it. Um, and so trying to figure out where there was a program that was going to fit some of his needs, if not all of his needs, was uh, a lot of work. The programs that were most valuable for uh, my son in high school, I think probably was his special ed transition um, studies class because he could go in there at any time, um, not just the period that he was assigned to, and he could talk with that teacher about what his frustrations were, where he was um, possibly getting stuck, um, or if he just showed up and was in there during an unexpected time, she would know to start probing and, and kind of asking him what was going on. And I think by having that program, um, it, it probably did beyond wonders in helping him just to know that he can actually accomplish um, these types of things, but that he does need to find those safe people and resources that he can go to. The youth transition program at our high school actually did help my son quite a bit. They, he went through um, their coffee cart experience in which um, 
he only did it for one year, although they offered it to him for um, more than one year, but he figured, no, I got this down, I, I love it. Um, he thinks of himself today even as a barista and can, can work anywhere in a barista, and I'm sure that he would have the skills to be able to do it because they broke it down and taught him each individual skill right during that class, and I think that that was a, a phenomenal program. I think some of the greatest barriers uh, for uh, students with Asperger's and high-functioning autism as far as employment is uh, communication, some of their problem-solving abilities, uh, and social appropriateness in the workplace. And these are things that get improvement through practice, and, uh, and there needs to be a lot of time and effort put into that. And so a student can get a job, but may not be able to maintain that job. And so, and again, there's a lot of skills training that goes into that. Um, you know, we've had kids that have had all kinds of problems in, in their training. You know, maybe they do something inappropriate or say something inappropriate at a lunch break with other employees around that would be completely appropriate for school but not be, you know, appropriate in the workforce. Maybe they, uh, maybe they greet somebody in a store to informally, again, not having that experience of this is what you would do in a school. That may be okay for a school, for instance, to come up and hug somebody, but it's not okay, you know, if you're working at one of our job sites. Uh, communication, a lot of times not being able to tell people, um, you know, not being able to communicate a problem or something that they can't do at work um, or avoiding a problem at work. Some of the problem solving situations of knowing who to go to and knowing when an appropriate time to communicate with them about an issue that you're having at work. These are all things that, that can be learned, but they're learned over time and they're learned with experience. And one of the things I like about running training sites is you have that kind of flexibility to make an error or make a mistake that, that you normally would, you wouldn't have in a, in a, in a nine to five job. And so getting that experience I think is important. So we go into the community and we work with employers to create, uh, it's a non-paid, it's almost like an internship. Um, the students work there because we're on a block scheduling system. They work about five, six hours a week, uh, which is every other day for a couple hours. Uh, we travel train them to their site, which means taking the TriMed or walking, depending on where the site is. Most of our sites aren't within walking distance. So TriMed is a big part of what we do. And so the students go into that training site and kind of have a first job experience. Um, and they're trained and it's starting from, they follow company policies. For instance, at Burlington Coat Factory, they wear what an employee at Burlington Coat Factory. They clock in just like an employee would at Burlington Coat Factory. They're working there with uh, a TPA, which is a transition assistant, and then eventually the idea is that you're trying to get moved towards independence. So we're working on them with whatever um, challenges that they may have in the work world, and then the idea is eventually we kind of pull back. You know, if there's a mistake or there, there's something that needs to be worked on, we come back a little bit, and then we, they're never completely, at the training programs, they're never completely independent, but they have that kind of safety net of, of us working. Um, we have good, very candid conversations with the employers. They fill out an evaluation. They usually do kind of an exit interview where they talk with the student and say, well, if you were to work at a competitively employed job, if we were to hire you at Albertsons, if we were to hire you at Burlington Co. Factory, here's what you would need in order to be, you know, to be a full-time employee with us. And so, and those are good skills too, because sometimes, you know, a student will go to work you know, they'll be at the job training site, they'll get a grade from us, but they're still not ready for the full-time competitive employment. And, and so they have a good idea of what they need to work on. There are a number of six, uh, barriers to uh, successful transition into a college or community college. Uh, one of, I think the biggest one is not having a plan. Um, not connecting with uh, the disability services at the university. Most universities, I think all universities and community colleges have Office of Disabilities. A lot of times students that are in our program connect with the Office of Disabilities midway through their freshman year or after they're already having struggles. Um, so one of the things that we try to do is once we find out what university or college that they're entered in, we try to get them connected with that Office of Disabilities. 
to have them in, enrolled, to know that they're a student there, to help them out with assistance on housing if they need to, which brings me to another point that housing can be an issue for students with Asperger's and high functioning autism. We recently had a kid who was accepted to the Oregon Institute of Technology um, who was looking at housing, uh, individual housing, and said that he didn't have a roommate. We had this idea that this is how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to go to college. You're supposed to take 15 credits. You're supposed to work a part-time job. And so we, part of the conversation that we, that we have is, what are you ready for? What are, what, as a student, what do you want to do? Do you think you can do five classes? You know, maybe you want to get your feet wet and start with one or two. Maybe you want to get a part-time job you know, while you're taking your one or two classes. Maybe you want to solely focus on school because you're try you want to go to a four-year university. What is going to realistically work for you? And you can kind of gauge that by some of the things that are that are happening at school. So if they're having trouble taking a full load of classes at school at a high school, they're going to have trouble taking a full load of classes at a college. And so kind of coming with that up with that plan of, you know, what what are you ready for? And a student can usually give you a good idea. They give you plenty of hints. Autism and Asperger's are, in, are interesting in that you have students who perform high in school but may have uh, poor adaptive skills. And I think that's a major challenge in getting kids served for transition. So I, I know that I'm, there are a number of kids that don't get served by DD or developmental uh, disability services because, again, there's this impression from grades that they are, are higher, are performing higher than they are, and they are not thinking about the challenges that they would have with their particular disability in the community. There are a number of community services that would help students and families transition into adulthood. Um, and here in Washington County, I believe that we have an excellent voc rehab. I would say another good one is the WorkSource Oregon, uh, which is good at helping uh, find jobs. They also have um, uh, computers that kids can use. Uh, they also have courses um, in like how to write a resume, how to do a job interview, things like that. Um, I would say Job Corps, although Job Corps just went on a stoppage, they're back. Right now they're very undermanned. <laughs> um, but the Job Corps has very been, we've had several students who've done well at Job Corps. We had one student who went to a welding presentation over at the Northwest Career Fair um, in, the, in Portland and ended up um, being very interested, talking to the Job Corps, going on the, going on the Job Corps interview, um, and they said, well, it may take six months. And he was in California with his family. They called him a week after school and said, we have a slot for you. Can you come back up here? Uh, he did training in a year and a half and now works as a welder. And was very committed, knew what he wanted to do, loved welding, but and got very good training there. I've had very few bad experiences with Job Corps. Getting again, but again, getting into Job Corps and having to follow through and doing all the things that you need to do, um, you know, can be a barrier to get into Job Corps. Because my son was has a medical diagnosis and an educational diagnosis of. Um, autism, but he is on the high functioning side, um, it was real difficult because there were a lot of services that he did not qualify for, for DD services or for Social Security or for any of those extra services that would help him um, past graduation and even somewhat through getting through school. Um, and so we had to kind of look beyond, and it just was a lot, a lot more effort on my part to push for those. Coming from a small community, the only resources that we really have available for our autistic community is if they're on a much lower functioning, um, skill set. We don't have a lot of availability for kids who are very clearly autistic but higher functioning. Voc Rehab has been the key in helping us to make um, a transition into the college setting because without Voc Rehab I would not have been able to um, 
have any of the services that we do have, which are still pretty minimal, but are definitely worth going through the process of getting. Well, travel training is the key to independence, and it may be, it's one of the most important steps. Um, in travel training, one of the things that parents can do is start that process early. Start, start taking, um, and travel training is not just taking the bus. It's walking across the street. It's walking through a mall. Um, it, it's no, being aware of your environment. And so starting that process before you're even worried about whether, you know, to get a driver's license or, um, or, or a bus pass, starting that process of being aware of where they are in the environment. Um, I would say practicing at home. I would say taking, if you have a public transportation system, taking that bus to appointments, going to the doctor, um, going, going to school, um, going on weekend trips. Um, I know that TriMet here in Portland the tri uh, has TriMet Tripwise, where you can plan your trips. Having um, your child or student plan a trip is very important. Um, a lot of times, a student will follow the adult on the bus, whether they're with a program or with their, with their parents. And a lot of times that, that's not real travel training and it will be kind of shocking to the parents that when they do it on their own, there, there's, there's different kind of, you know, there's, it's a whole different world. Um, another thing that I would look at is, um, is how you interact with, with strangers. Um, it's, it's also an eye-opening experience when we have students take up on a bus who talks to them. Um, you know, we've had students who've, who've been tried to take advantage of money-wise. You know, can I borrow a dollar for my bus fare um, type of activities? And those are things that students don't normally get when, they, when they're with their parents taking a bus, but they need that experience of, of, of how to interact with other individuals. What do you do when, when there's an argument on a bus or when there's a problem with paying your fare? And so those are all skills that tra travel training is, is kind of all-inclusive. You know, it's being able to safely get from point A to point B, um, and that's including walking across the street, being aware of your environment, um, being aware of others around you, um, knowing, you know, that there are, are people out there who may try to take advantage of you, you know, and, and, and safety. And those are the big areas of travel training. Uh, as far as a, a student being ready for driving, I, I think, again, it would be, it's just like basic travel training you know, making them pay attention to the rules of the road when they're driving, being able to identify stop signs, being able to, when you're driving um, with your child, seeing good and bad, you know, behavior and having your child point out, well, that guy just kind of rolled through that stop sign. You know, being able to kind of follow those rules and know those rules. I would say the top living, uh, daily living skills are, are money management, and that's not just having a bank account. A lot of students will have a checking account or savings account, and they'll have money put into it, but the responsibility of spending money. So, um, and again, an area that parents can, um, it, it could be as simple as helping out with a cell phone bill. You know, um, you know having money that, uh, that your child or student spends on the weekends, that's their money. Um, again, so it's more money management and then having a plan for how you're going to live on your own. It's very eye-opening and I teach a futures planning class. It's very eye-opening for kids once we take how they live now and we transform that, what if you were paying for that? And so one of the activities that we do is we go over everything that they could possibly spend money on. You buy a shirt, how many shirts do you buy a year? You buy jeans, you know, what is your cable bill? What is your phone bill? You know, we ask them to pretend like their parents, in some cases, or their roommates, and you're splitting an apartment with two other people. What would be your side of the bill? And then we figure out how much they would have to make in order to live the lifestyle that they're currently living. In most cases, we come up between eighteen and twenty-five thousand dollars, which is a lot of money for a kid who hasn't had a job before, hasn't had work experience. I would say the biggest challenge that I foresee coming up in the future is since he is out of high school and he has he is completing the college program now is that big next step which is moving out into the world and out of mom's house and into his own 
place wherever that may be with peers or by himself or with a sibling or whatnot. And uh, I think that because he is high functioning and does not qualify for a lot of the programs that are out there that help in that process for some um, individuals, it will monetarily fall back on me to try and help guide him through um, finding a place to live, finding a job, figuring out how to pay the bills and things like that. It's, it's tad overwhelming at times, but um, he's a good kid and he's a smart kid. Um, in high school, I had to make a very difficult decision because he was turning 18 before he graduated from high school. And about a year prior to that, I started receiving information about um, what it would take for me to um, get guardianship over him. And I felt like I wasn't really ready to go there yet because he's an individual that is so high functioning that I didn't necessarily feel like I wanted to take over guardianship and make all the decisions for him. He is high enough functioning that he has the capabilities of making decisions for himself and I felt like I needed to support that decision and not override that. Um, I very easily could have overridden it and just told him, sign this paper, and he would have happily done it. But I don't think in the long run, it really would have been beneficial for him. I think the key skill sets for individual independent living for uh, individuals is uh, personal management, uh, personal organization, follow through. I think it's helpful to have support, either family support or organizational support. Um, and also ID supports outside of, of your parents and your family. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is the four areas of transition, which are jobs and careers, education, training, personal and social. Uh, in community living, having some of those supports in other areas, you know, where you live, having a, uh, having a social system. One of the things that we hear a lot when kids come back is not that they're not doing well in school or they're having trouble in their job, but I'm out of Southridge. I've been out of Southridge for two years and all I do is I go to work and I go, and I go home and I watch TV. And so that's one of the biggest things that we, having that, you know, you have this this building or this system for 12 years of your education and then you're out and and so I think it's important to have friends and, ha and have avenues and, and that needs to be considered when you're talking about transition. Um, I would say self-advocacy, you know, we're, you know, a lot of times people get used to having their parents as an advocate, having their teachers for an advocate. Um, that's the one thing that when you're out of, you know, out of the building, you need to, you need to connect. I know with, on the college question I answered um, about the Office of the Student or Disabilities, you'd be surprised at the number of students who were like, who've been on an IEP all the way through school and have decided that they don't need any extra assistance now that they're out. And they find very quickly in most cases that they do. Being able to know where you can go and having the ability to go do it. You know, a lot of times people have done things for the student. And just have, not having that safety net out there is big. Um, I would say being the process for making a decision um, and having some kind of plan, a transition plan. Um, we do a transition plan before the students leave here in the four areas. Um, they present that at their exit IEP. Um, that plan includes jobs and careers, what they're thinking about doing in the future, education and training specifically, you know, what do you need to do to connect with that job that you want. Uh, personal and social, where are you going to live, knowing exactly how much it's going to cost, whether you know, knowing how much it's going to cost to live on your own versus living with your parents, what bills you can afford, what kind of money that you would need to make in order to support the lifestyle that you want. Uh, and again, that personal, it often overlooked personal and social. You've had this high school to connect with, even if you were kind of on the periphery uh, of the educational or of the high school community. 
and you have friends here, you, you have connections, you, most kids are involved in some kind of club. You know, when you go out, it's, it's a, completely different, uh, a completely different world. Making sure you have those connections, and one of the things that we do with personal and social is we, we look at the kids' area of interest, students' areas of interest, and then we try to connect them with things that they're interested in. If you're interested in anime, which is a big one, then let's say, you know, PCC has an anime club. You know, Beaverton Library has an anime. Um, so connecting the student with possible areas of interest in order to meet people when they leave the school, I think is a big one. Um, now that he is out of high school and finishing up his college one-year program, um, I see our biggest challenges is me still having to help him in just basic daily living skills such as reminding him that once a week he needs to um, have all of his uniforms cleaned and ready to go for the next week or um, just management of his time. Um, he doesn't have a whole lot that he's bringing home from school because of the program that he's been in, but I think that if he went into any kind of college program in which there was going to be homework, I think that it would be a huge challenge. Um, and I think that there would be a lot of time spent at home for me to help organize that for him and, and trying to figure out how he was going to manage his time around that. Right now, presently, it's trying to figure out that next step of he's finishing up this program because um, it was only a one-year program and now he knows that he wants to get a job but he's beginning to panic about what are all those steps that it takes and so having to help him by writing it down um, putting it into some kind of order for him of what you do first and I'm sure we'll modify it a lot. first transition, uh, you can never start too early. You can never, you know, we give transition plans sometimes to kids that are coming up and it's kind of a transition worksheet. Sometimes to kids that are coming up in seventh and eighth grade and they're like, why are you giving this to me? I have no idea what I want to do. And it changes and that's great. But starting that process, starting, well, what do I need to think about? What kind of classes, you know, so I want to be a doctor. What kind of classes do I need to be a doctor? What do I need to be you know, challenging them with, you know, knowing their strengths and, and weaknesses, um, making them a part of the process, and I mean early, uh, you know, as early as late elementary if possible, um, making them part of the process and feeling comfortable will also help with self-advocacy. Um, if you have a student who's been talking to teachers in junior high, then it's not as hard to do when they're in high school. When they're starting at in high school, you know, even late high school, it's, start, it's harder to roll that over into college. So you, as far as I'm concerned, you can never start transition too early. I think the most important thing that um, me as a parent can do and others as a parent can do is continue to be there for them and to support them um, and help them out when they need gentle reminders um, of how to advocate through this world that we call a world, but then to give them lots of praise when they're showing that they can do it. For more information, please visit our website.